Well, good morning to you. It's good to see you here today. We're going to be looking at Psalm, uh, Psalm Isaiah 53 and um, in th the entire chapter. Wonderful passage dealing with the suffering servant. And um, in a little prelude to Christmas is coming, the promised one is coming, and that's what's prophesied here. Um, I'm reminded so many times that um, it's a blessing to have the Word of God. My uh, father-in-law went over to Cambodia and visited some Christians there, and they had to take their boats, and they all went out in, separately in little canoes, and they went out to this bigger boat out in the middle of the lake, and they turned all the lights out and had one little candle down there, and they whisper sang or whispered or hummed or whatever, as low as they could, their songs and had their Bible study out in the middle of the lake with their canoes tied all around it. So if they saw anybody approaching, it's into that canoe and everybody going a different direction. Just because they weren't allowed to study the Word of God. And I thought, wow, what an opportunity we have. Most of us have a Bible or two that we can look at and uh, enjoy the Word of God. A blessing to have. The promised one. I'm going to talk about that today. The coming of Christmas is the promise one came. What a savior. Since the existence of Adam and Eve, even before the foundation of the world, God had a plan. Man needed a savior. He knew the weakness of man and his total depravity apart from a savior. He knew that what would take place by Eve making her choice, and he knew what Adam's great affection for Eve would do as it led him to disobedience. From Genesis 3.15, the prediction that Satan would crush his heel, but he would destroy the head of the serpent, God was foretelling of a time when the people would be looking forward to a Savior, as we see in Isaiah today. And we'll read the text here in just a moment. He's foretelling the news of a suffering servant, a sinless Savior that would save man from his sin that left him so desperately weary and guilty and under the wrath of God. Thomas Kramer, centuries ago, said our problem is not only just guilty feelings, but objective moral guilt before God. Romans 3.19 put it this way. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth must be closed and all the world may be accountable to God, because of by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Guilt becomes unbearable, intolerable. If we had to answer for what we've done, we'd all be crushed. Just for a moment, think with me. Now, I've lived a little bit, and you don't believe I'm 71, but I am. I've lived a little bit. I've seen a few things, and I've done a few things, and done a few things wrong. But for a moment, just my sins and your sins, for all the time that we live, that's a lot of sin snacked up. Now, but combine, combine that with the Bakersfield and Kern County and the state of California and our nation of America and the world, and you have a well, I don't even know if I could say the quadrillions of times quadrillion sins that have stacked up. And Jesus came to take all of those away. We sometimes wish we could go back and do things over. Amen? If you could go back and do some things over right now, would you do it? Everybody that I know except one told me they would. One very prideful lady said that she wouldn't do anything different than she did. I said, nothing? She said, nothing. Well, I let it go. I didn't argue with her, but I walked away thinking, wow, either that lady's perfect, which I know she wasn't, or she's lying. We all wish we could do something over. Some of you will recognize Pete Rose. He played for the Cincinnati Reds. He's the... Well, that's what shall I say. He's the all-time leader in baseball hits in America. 
But he'll never be in the Hall of Fame, or at least he's not there yet, and he's had plenty of opportunities to be there, but because of the cheating that was done and all the betting that he did on baseball games and other things. He said these, and these are his words, I can't change what happened. All I want is a second chance. We all look at life and think about our past. We agonize in that we wish we could relive that moment. If only I could trade in my records for a better one. Well, I want you to know today that God has a plan and you can trade in some things and they can be all taken away. God has a plan. In Isaiah 53, one through four, he describes the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. In verses five through eight, we look at his death. In verse nine of this chapter, we look at his burial. And verses 10 through 12, we look at the resurrection and exaltation of Jesus. Now, the theme of the chapter is simply this. The innocent servant who became our savior died in the place of the guilty. He took the place of guilty sinners and paid the price for our salvation. And the first nine verses of Isaiah deal with the suffering of our savior. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. Isaiah 53, and uh, I'll read the first three verses. Now, I mentioned to you, I know that many times the verses are up on the, on the board, but I mentioned that take your Bible so that you can see for yourself. One of the best things that ever happened to is my parents gave me a Bible that had absolutely no helps in it whatsoever. None. One of those old, some of you probably laughing with me because you got one of those Bibles, and they got no helps whatsoever. And so I began to learn the Bible by reading something here, and I read this over here, and then I would start, put that verse over here and that verse over there, until after a while, I began to know something. And uh, I learned it. So I'm, I'm encouraging you, if you have a Bible, take it out so that you can see it for yourself. Verses 1 through 3. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground, he he had no stately form or majesty, that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hid their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for this morning. I pray that you would direct the thoughts into my mind, the words on my tongue, that I might speak those things that you want this, your body, to hear. And even across the internet where people are listening, Lord, will you take charge and take control so that your word goes forth and it will accomplish what you desire to do. And I pray it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I have four points to make it simple for you. And in the fourth point, there's three sub points. First of all, a severe humiliation that we see in verses one through three. Now, the servant is God, and yet he becomes human and he grows up. The child is born, and that's his humanity, while retaining his deity. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For a child shall be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. Now, our text tells us that Jesus is God. He's the root of David. He's fully man. He's the offspring of David, as Revelation twenty two sixteen says, the offspring of David. Now, Israel is, wasn't a paradise at that time, especially at the time when Jesus was born. Politically, spiritually, it was a wilderness of dry ground. The text here tells us that he did not come as a great tree, but as a tender plant. He was born in poverty in Bethlehem, and he grew up in a carpenter's shop in the despised city of Nazareth. Jesus didn't have a halo about him. Some of the old pictures you see, and they have Jesus with a little halo around him. He had no halo. Even his own family didn't recognize him as someone that was extraordinary. They misjudged him. In fact, at one time, his mother and his brothers came to see him because they thought he, they were, he was beside himself. And he said, your brother, they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside. They're waiting for you. And he knew what he said. My mother and my brothers are those who do the will of God. 
Whoo, what a powerful statement. Imagine how the people felt when they heard those words. People misjudged him. Even John the Baptist was uncertain about him. The woman at the well certainly didn't recognize that Jesus anything uh, because of his appearance as anything grand or noble about him. The, of course, the more she talked to him, she couldn't understand him, call him at a prophet and then sir. And finally, she came to understand that this guy knows everything about me. And she recognized something extraordinary. The Bible tells us that he, his words, by his words and his works, Jesus attracted great crowds. But nothing about his physical appearance made him any different than any other Jewish man. Once the crowds misunderstood his message that he came to preach, they began to walk away. He preached the message of take up your cross and follow me. Well, they knew all about crosses because many people had been crucified there by the Romans. And they turned and they all left him. So much so that Jesus turned to his disciples and said, will you go also? Simon Peter finally came through. You know, we're always saying Simon Peter had a hoof and mouth disease and, you know, he's always getting it wrong. He got it right this time. He got it right. He said, Lord, he said, where shall we go? You have the words of life. And Jesus said to him, blessed are our Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father, which is above. He got it. He got the picture. And Jesus commended him for it. Later, we find out Jesus had cried on the cross, Father, why have you forsaken me? When all the sins of the world were cast on him, the father looked away and Jesus felt a severe loneliness for the first time in his life. I tend not to like to be alone. I like to go where people are. Now, I know there's some people, that would get, they could stay in a cubby hole all day and a deal in a computer and they could be there all day and be perfectly content. I think I, I died an early death that that happened to me. I'm just not geared that way. But I remember as a child, I went to Carlsbad Cavern. How many of you have gone to Carlsbad Cavern? You've been there. Well, the last service meant over half the people have been there. And uh, this must be a younger crowd, obviously. They take you down inside the Carlsbad Caverns there, and they tell you ahead of time that they're going to turn off the lights. And they want you to understand how pitch black it is down in that huge cavern. And so they tell you, now we're going to turn off the lights. And when we do, uh, just remain calm. We'll turn the lights on in one minute. So just be calm. And then they tell you, take your hand and touch your nose like this. Now withdraw just a couple of inches, just a couple of inches is all. And they turn off all the lights. I'm telling you, it is so dark in there. You cannot see even your hand that's right here. And they leave the lights off for a minute and your eyes never adjust to how dark it is. It's that dark. I'm telling you, this is what happened to me. When about 30 seconds or so came along, I began to reach out to see if I could touch somebody. <laughs> I feel I was down there all by myself. I got a little nervous. I was a youngster, but nevertheless, pitch black. They just left it. I'll tell you, I was... Uh, I felt just a little bit alone as that time was ticking away. Well, the Bible says that darkness came over the earth for about three hours, and Jesus was suffering for all the vile sins of the world. He was the promised one. We were to look to him that he was going to come for mankind. Now, in the month of December, I'm told that there are more suicides in America than any other time. That's the loneliest time for people. And Jesus went to the cross when everybody had run from him and he died alone. But here's the, here's the kicker. The Bible says that his father looked away from him. For the first time in his life, he found out what real loneliness was all about. Maybe you've experienced that. Maybe you've had to come to grips with that. Maybe you're dealing with it right now. I want to tell you that you're not alone, that God loves you, that he has a plan for your life. But the people rejected his message and they treated him like any other slave. They despised him and they put a cheap price on him. 
Isaiah 53, 3, they looked the other way as he went by. They were ashamed of him because he did not represent the things that were important to him, like freeing them from the tyranny of Rome that Jesus never talked about. Wealth and social prestige and reputation and being served by other people and pampering yourself. It's a message that's to reject today or rejected today. People are searching for an easy gospel. What's the minimum requirement I can do to get by and that God will let me into heaven and I'll be okay. It's amazing how many people feel like that when they get to heaven, if their good outweighs their bad, they're going to make it in. Have you met people like that? I've talked to so many people and I ask them, I said, are you, are you, you know, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? And standard answers is, well, I hope I will. Wow. Well, sometimes I meet somebody and they'll say to me, yeah, I think I'm going to go. And I go, well, why? Well, that's great. Why are you going to go, be able to go to heaven? And there's what they say. Well, you know, I don't, I'm not so, such a bad guy. I don't do this and I don't do that and I don't do this and I try to do this, this, and this. So they got it, the deal that worked out of here's the side of bad stuff and here's the side of good stuff. And if my good outweighs my bad, then somehow God's going to say, welcome aboard. That's the prevailing view for most people. If somehow my good outweighs my bad, he'll take all that in consideration and hopefully he'll grade on the curve. <laughs> Despite the plain truth of the gospel, many people today are following any Pied Piper of liberalism who has a tune they can dance to and who makes them feel like everything's going to be all right since God loves all people anyway. But my friend, all people are not going to heaven. Despite what famous uh, Commentator said, I guess you could call her, Oprah Winfrey, said that she believed that Jesus is one way that you can get heaven, to get to heaven, but he's not the only way. But those are not the words of Jesus when he said that no man comes unto the Father but by me. You're going to get to the Father through me. That's, by the way, why we pray in Jesus' name. You know, on the end of most prayers, well, he taught us to pray this way because when the prayer goes to the Father, it comes through Jesus. So we pray in Jesus' name, entrance to the Father. When you get to heaven, you're not going to get to heaven based on your merits. You're going to get to based on the fact that you're in Christ and he's given you his righteousness, taking all your sin away, and you become what? You become the very righteousness of God because of what Jesus did on the cross for you. You can't say, well, you, did you see I did this, this, and this, and this, and this? And they won't count. Why? Because of the sinfulness of man's heart. It's a strange thing. When I talk to people and, and, I'll, and ask them, but if you think you're going to go to heaven, and uh, they'll tell me, well, this and this and this. And I say, well, you know, there's no sin in heaven. How are you going to get there? You being a sinful creature, how are you going to get there? Now, I, when I talk with people, I don't try to be mean. I just try to open up some dialogue and give them some questions to think about. All roads don't lead to heaven. Only through Jesus. Well, let's get to the second point. There's a severe humiliation, but there's a substitutionary death in verses 4 through 6. And if you have your Bibles or if you see it on the board. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet he was... Yet we ourselves esteemed him the stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastising of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. In other words, the, the innocent Savior, the servant Savior, dies for the, for, as a sacrifice for sin. Why did he suffer and die? Well, look at these plural pronouns. Our griefs and our sorrows and our iniquities, our transgressions. All we like sheep have gone astray. We turn each to our own way. In other words, we don't want anybody to tell us what to do. You remember when you were growing up and you were in, the, in the high school and you just couldn't wait to get out of high school? Because nobody would tell you what to do. <laughs> you could be your own boss. Well, that is liberating, but you find in time that you need, everybody's under somebody's authority, no matter where they go. 
no matter where you live. But sheep, man, they're very stupid. They're, I'm sorry, they're stupid. We are helpless. We wander off a lot of times. The Bible says we like sheep. We wander through our own futile self-remedies and self-righteous excuses. He didn't die for anything he had done. He had died because of what we had done. He really was a man of sorrows, but they weren't his own. He didn't deserve them. In a way that we can't explain, it, Jesus was our substitute. He died on our behalf. God did what we can, what we can be forever grateful for. He paid a debt we couldn't pay and gave us a hope and a future we didn't deserve. Was the, his death vital? Yes. Was it vicarious? That means substitutionary? Yes. The promised one was coming. My friend, what a savior. He took your place. He took all of your sin and put it on himself. We go on and further, it says he's wounded, which means he was pierced through. His hands and feet were pierced by nails and side was by, by a spear. He was crucified. The Jewish execution was that of stoning. But if you wanted to really humiliate somebody, then he, he would to die on a cross where he stripped of all of his clothes and hung up there after a beating that Jesus took where his beard was pulled out of his face. They buffeted him with his face. And the Bible says you could hardly recognize him. And then they led him to the cross in which he couldn't make. And they put him up on the cross where he died in our place. Galatians 6, 13 says this, says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. In other words, the promised one would be cursed on your behalf. Why? Why? The guilty party. Why would the, the, the guiltless die for the guilty? The Bible tells us in Romans 5, 8, scarcely would a man die for a righteous man, but God died for the ungodly while they were still in their sin. I think that I would die for my wife. I think I would die for my country. I don't really know until the time comes, but I'd like to think it would, but for somebody who hates you, somebody who speaks bad about you, would you die for them who oppose you? And Jesus did that while we were running from him. He wooed us to himself. On the cross, Jesus is bruised, which means he was crushed under the weight of, of the burden. What What, what burden? All the sins of the world, past, present, and future, are going to be dumped upon him. Dumped upon him. Sin indeed is a burden that grows heavier and longer the more that we resist him. The more we resist and the more we resist, the burden gets, grows longer and longer. Chastised means he was given many stripes. To us, this punishment brought healing and, and peace. And the only way a lawbreaker can come get, uh, be at peace with the law is to suffer the punishment that the law gives out. The law demands certain things. And Jesus kept the law perfectly, yet he suffered the whipping that belonged to you and me. Because he took our place, we can have peace with God. We no longer have to be estranged, and we won't be condemned by God's law anymore. Isn't it nice to know all those sins when you became a child of God and you ask him to be the boss of your life and to forgive you for sins, he took all of those sins and he wiped them all out, never to remember them again. <laughs> Woo, you know how liberating that is? I racked up some sins. I don't know about you. God took it all away. And he wants to do that for every single person. That's why we call him wonderful, so precious. Last week, we learned of God's killing an animal and providing for Adam and Eve a covering. An animal was killed and they covered themselves up. In other words, an atonement was made for their sin. 
Then we also, last week in Exodus, we learned about the lamb being slain and the blood taken and put on the doorpost. And they put it up on the lintel and the doorpost. And, and uh, for the, when the death angel came, every household that had the blood on the doorpost and the lintel, the death angel passed over them, whether they were Jewish or Gentile. And they were spared. What saved them? Their good works, their nice thoughts, the good deeds that they had done, the blood of the lamb, sacrifice for them. Well, not only was this one to come to be a savior, he had to be without sin. He had to be like a lamb that we learned last week. Perfect, without spot, without blemish, couldn't be sick, no disease, nothing. Jesus was perfect in every way, in every thought and disposition. Do you know, here's the sad thing about living in this flesh. You don't have to move anywhere and you sin while you're sitting still. Amen? You don't have to go anywhere. In fact, as the old country western song was saying, and all I got to do is act naturally. Just be myself. Hmm. Well, this is the crux of the whole matter. Who could be sinless that could take away all the sins of the world? And the Bible tells us only one, Jesus. Revelation goes even further to say that no one was able to open the scroll for the saints to enter heaven. There was only one. They looked in heaven and earth and beneath the earth, and they could find no one except for Jesus, the perfect one, to open the scroll. Under the law of Moses, sheep died for the shepherd. But under grace, the good shepherd dies for the sheep. Aren't you glad you're under grace today? Whew. Imagine if you were still under the law and you had to obey every one of those laws. Hundreds of them. Shoot, we can't even obey the Ten Commandments, much less add, add them up what they explain them to be. Well, let's go on. Not only did Jesus suffer a, a severe humiliation and, and a substitutionary death, but he was a silent servant. Verses 7 through 9, if you want to look on with me. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. And like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shears, he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. Silent servant. Servants in those days were not permitted to speak. <laughs> there were severe repercussions if you did. You were just to do as you were told. And Jesus was silent for those who accused him as well as those who afflicted him. Silent before Caiaphas, the high priest, and the elders and Herod Antipas. He didn't speak to the soldiers who mocked him and spat at him. I, you know, I, I got a mind to just run sometimes. And you know how they were beating him and they were pulling the beard out of his face and beating him with those big insignia rings so they could hardly recognize him. And uh, they blindfolded him and said, prophesy and tell us who did this. Well, it would have been just great, you know, to say, yeah, Joe, I know you really well from front of your Dan, boom, 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 just list out about six or eight things he'd know right off the bat. <laughs> I would have loved to have seen something like that. Now do your bidding, you know. He said nothing to them. It's what impressed the Ethiopian treasurer as he was reading on his way back to Egypt. You remember the supernaturally that Philip shows up and, and as he's reading Isaiah 53 and he doesn't understand why this slam doesn't say anything and he can't understand the suffering he's going through and Philip led by the Spirit of God says, can I help you understand that text? And God led him to get up and the Ethiopian was spanned. Yes. And that day he came to meet the Savior. But he didn't understand it. Jesus is illegally tried. There was about seven or eight things that were illegal in the trial. Condemned to death. Today, if you go to court and you find something's done illegally, they, you throw the case out or, you know, uh, it won't try it anymore or they declare a mistrial, whatever. He was silent. 
He didn't appeal for another trial. Here's what he did say in John 18, 11. This cup which my father has given me, shall I not drink of it? This is why I came. Shall I not drink of it? The servant is compared to a lamb, which is one of the most frequent symbols of the Savior. A lamb would be killed for each Jewish household at Passover, and the servant who became our Savior died for the people, the nation of Israel. John 129 says, Behold the Lamb of God. This was John the Baptist as they were walking. He identified Jesus. Who, and he said, that, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now in Revelation, Jesus has come, come back on a royal steed. He's going to be the victorious king. But also in Revelation, we find out the word lamb is used 28 times to refer to Christ. Referred to him. Verse 9, Jesus crucified with the criminals, but God got involved. Joseph of Arathea and Nicodemus took down Jesus' body after he was proclaimed dead by the, the Roman soldiers. And they took his body away and they buried him in a wealthy man's tomb, which fulfilled another one of the prophecies that he died with the criminals, but he was buried with a rich man. By the way, this prophecy was 700 years before Jesus came. There's so many prophecies that you go through and you think, how could the Bible know all that? Because it inspired by God who wrote through men. And God knew. Well, let's look at the next one, that final point today. Not only was this a, fear, a severe humil humiliation and a substitutionary death, and he became a silent servant, but it, there was a supreme satisfaction Three subpoints, and we'll be done in an illustration. Here we see at the cross from God's point of view. Wicked men, though they killed Jesus, Jesus' death was determined before the foundation of the world. Can you fathom that? Before the foundation of the world, Jesus already, God already knew that Jesus is going to go to the cross and die for us because we need a Savior. He knew that. Listen, if you're a child of God today, you didn't get lucky. God chose you Himself. He chose you. Most of us early, we were running from him. We don't have anything to do with him. Doing my own thing. I got it covered. This is the problem right here. But this is me on top of that problem. That's the way we were when we were much younger. We think we got it all together and we know. But listen to what the Bible says. God is satisfied. He's pleased with the Savior's work on the cross. In fact, let's just look at those verses before we go any further. Verses 10 and following. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he would see his offspring. He would prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord would prosper in his hand. And as a result of the anguish of his soul, he would see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I allot him a portion with the great. He will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death. He was numbered with the transgressors that he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. God was satisfied. Pleased with the Savior's work on the cross. It brought satisfaction since the servant satisfied the heart of the father. Jesus would say this, I always do what pleases him. In fact, Jesus, you won't find him anywhere in the deal saying, oh, I came to fulfill the law. Now, he did, but he doesn't come to say, my job is to come to fulfill the law, although he certainly did. Jesus said, I always do what pleases him. Paul said this in Philippians 2. He said, it is my ambition and aim in life to be pleasing to him. Pleasing to him. Nobody can keep the law. Because if you break in one part, you break the whole law. We're all guilty. That's why we need a savior. That's why Christmas is about the promised one that's coming. And he's coming again. He came once and he's coming again. It pleased the father that his son's obedience accomplished the redemption that he planned for eternity. No wonder the father could say, this is my beloved son, hear him. Listen to him. I say, what a savior. What a promise to come. 
One of these days, he's going to come back to collect us all. We celebrate Christmas because of the promise of a Savior coming. We often take sin lightly, but God doesn't. In fact, most people would say that Jesus primarily came to take away the sins of the world, and we know that, that he did do that. But he first had to do something else. He had to satisfy the wrath of God. So what are you talking about? John 3, 36 says, he that, know, he that believeth in me, well, no, that's not it. Let me see, maybe go back. Uh, uh, <laughs> see if I can get it right. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not have life, and the wrath of God abides on him. The wrath of God. Listen to Ephesians 2, 23. A uh, two, three. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath. Well, that's the bad news. <laughs> all of us under the wrath of God. First John 2, 2 says that he became a propitiation for us. Big word that means someone pays a ransom for requirements that need to be met in order for then something to be released. Jesus came, took the exact amount of punishment that was needed to be taken so that now the justice and righteousness of God has been satisfied, sin has been paid for, now mercy and grace and love and peace and all of that rest can be, re can be released unto us. He became our propitiation. So when people say, well, I hope I'm going to get to heaven it's because I did this and this and this and I didn't do that and that and that, they don't have a clue. They're as lost as can be. You can't get to heaven on your own merits. You can't get to heaven by obeying the law. One way you get to heaven, through Jesus and him alone. He became our propitiation. God was angry at sin because it offends his holiness and violates his holy law. But it pleased the Lord to crush him, crush Jesus, to put him to grief because he was crushed so, for our sins so that God's la wrath is eliminated and he could pour his mercy and his grace to you and me. I always said if I had another child, I'm not looking for one at 71, but if I had another child, I think I'd have named that child Mercy if it was a girl. Mercy. You know how much mercy we need? The things right now that we can't stand in other people, we're guilty of those very same things. Ever somebody seen somebody speeding down the road? I was driving one day, I was speeding, watching this guy, and he's shooting by me about 85 miles an hour. I got to say, where's a cop when you need one? And I looked down at my speed, and I was doing 75. <laughs> guilty of the very same thing that we condemn others for. Boy, it's a good thing God has mercy. Hmm. Well, let's close today. The second part underneath that, uh, the, the final point today, under supreme satisfaction, he did not remain dead. The Bible says he shall prolong his days. The servant would be resurrected to live forever. The many uh, tried to many tried to circumvent the, the cross, and they tried to not to get him to go to the cross. The Bible says he shall see his seed today because of Christ. He has thousands of children that are going to come home to be with him, millions upon millions. The Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, is now set down at the right hand of God. He has children who have been blessed with grace and mercy. The law has been satisfied. Justice has been paid uh, by Jesus. Sin was condemned in Christ, and we are made righteous in him. We who are shamefully guilty are now in Christ, declared righteousness, not based on anything that we did, but because of what he did on the cross, I accept his satisfaction, and because of that, he gives me his righteousness. Can you get a better trade than that? I don't know if you follow football and into baseball and all that. They're always talking about trades, and this guy make this trade and that trade, and what do you think of this trade? And all the TVs talks about it. They have all these commentators talking about trades. Is this the best trade ever? He took all your trash and all your filth and all the vile thoughts and all that stuff, and he took it away on himself. And 
And then in turn, he gave you his righteousness. <laughs> Can it get any better than that? Final point. Jesus is satisfied. The joy set before him. Down through the angel, ages, we see millions of people have found sweet release from guilt, pardon for transgressions, and healing from the leprosy of sin. This binds and tears people up. The Bible says that there's joy in heaven when one sinner repents. One. Imagine the rejoicing when millions over the years, billions maybe, have come to know him and follow him. Make them a new creation in Christ Jesus and begin the process of changes to be like him. Let me close with this illustration. Read this out of, well, I think, one of Max Licato's books. He said there was a monk and he had an apprentice and they were going to a nearby city. And on the way to the nearby city, they talked and they had a great time fellowshipping and they got to the city and they parted ways because they each had tasks to do and he said, I'll meet you back in the morning. So they met back in the morning and he, he, he said good morning to the young lad and the lad was kind of reserved and mumbled something and, and uh, so they began their journey and as uh, they were walking along the way, um, the, the monk said to him, his, to his apprentice, he said, is something wrong? And he goes, oh, nothing wrong. So they walked on. Monk knew something was obviously wrong, but they walked on. And as they're nearing the abbey, getting ready to go into that next city, he looks back at the young lad and he says, tell me, what's wrong? He said, well, he looked up into the warmth of his master's eyes and his heart began to melt. And he said, I've sinned greatly. And he started crying. He said, last night I slept with a woman. I abandoned my vows. I'm no longer worthy to enter the abbey by your side. And the wise monk put his arm around him and said, come on. We're going to go into the abbey together. We're going to go into that cathedral together. And we're going to walk up to the altar and we're going to pray. And no one will know whose sins we're confessing. And I'm going to go with you through it all. Well, as good as that is and as good as it sounds, Jesus did more than that. He did more than that. The Bible says he was crushed for our sin. He accepted our shame and he offers to lead us into the presence of God. And I say to you once again, what a savior. What a promise to come. He did it all. We sing a song, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left the crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. He did it, not you. You get to partake in it because he did it for you. What a promise. What a promise to come. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your gospel message that enables to come to an understanding it's not based on our merit that we get to heaven, but based on what you did in our place for us, dying a substitutionary death that was so vital and so necessary that we might be victorious in our own life. God, how we thank you for that. Oh, how we thank you. You are a wonderful Savior. As we look forward in this Christmas season, You've done so much to help mankind, and you're still in the process of wooing people to you. And today, Lord, I may be speaking to somebody, whether online or right here in this building, who does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior. They know information. They know some facts, but they don't know you. They don't know what forgiveness of sin is all about. They don't know about how you can empower them to live above the presence and power of sin, the penetrating claws that sin digs into us and tears at us and claws at us and rips us apart. They don't know real peace because they don't know you. I pray for that person today, that they would come and say, yes, 
I want to know this Savior, what a Savior He is. I pray for the Christian today, truly a saved person. I pray for them, the Lord, that they would use their abilities and their times and talents to help bring in the, ki ki bring in the kingdom of God. Not just talk about it, not just say somebody else can do this or somebody else can do that, but they're vitally involved in the transformation process. Here am I, Lord, use me. Help us, Lord, to be grateful eternally for what you've done. For I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you today to stand for our closing hymn. As we stand, if you're here today and you'd like to know about this Savior, there are going to be men down in front waiting to tell you. If you'd like to just to rededicate your life today and say, you know what? I haven't lived like I need to, but you know today, I'm going to make that change. I'm going to do it today. I'm going to live for him. Come, take one of these men's hands and say, pray for me. I want to walk with God better than I'm walking today. Can you not be ashamed of that? Can anybody not pray that prayer? I want to be a better man or a woman today than when I walked in. I'm renewing my life. As we sing together, you come.